So our next speaker is Doug Finkbeiner, talking about mapping dust in 3D with stellar colors. Okay, good. Testing one, two, three. So um, when I arrived at Berkeley as a grad student in 1994, the way people estimated dust extinction was the Bernstein Hylus map. And um, I wanted to be a cosmologist when I grew up. And Mark Davis said, if you want to do something useful for cosmology, make a dust map that's better. So um, that got me started thinking about dust a long time ago. What we've been doing lately is to make dust maps with stellar reddenings, which is uh, in some ways a new idea, but also the oldest idea for making dust maps. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work here. So um, depending on what you want to do with your dust map, you really have different requirements. Cosmologists want something with high precision and good angular resolution at high latitude. People working on the Milky Way want something in 3D. The precision's not very important if you aren't sure whether your object's in front of or behind the dust, right? So the 3D aspect is much more important uh, than the overall precision in some cases. Um, so these are the kinds of maps we had in the past. That's the SFD map from 98. This is a recent version of the Planck dust map. They're made in very similar ways, just looking at the emission from the dust. But there are problems. If you have dust emission and you want reddening, uh, you have to assume the reddening law is, well, you don't have to, but what is commonly done is to assume the reddening law is universal. But we know RV varies. We know that's demonstrably false. Um, I'll say a little more about Schlafly et al. here with the uh, 40,000 apogee spectra. So uh, if you drive the maps directly from stellar reddening, you can fit the RV as you do it. Um, also, and, and this is an underappreciated problem for cosmology, the emission from the large-scale structure in the universe leaks in to infrared-based dust maps. Now, we did an estimate of this in the early 2000s for SFD, and said, oh, this won't be a problem because we're thinking Sloan. But if you go to LSST and the kind of precision that we're going to have in the future for cosmology, this gets to be a real problem that you know, all the galaxies in the universe are in the map except for the ones that we're bright enough to remove. Um, again, if you drive your maps from stellar reddening, this isn't a problem. Also, dust temperature variation. So when we did SFD, and, and the Planck people do this now, you assume the variation in the dust color temperature you see is, first of all, that it's actual physical temperature variation, and that it's caused by the interstellar radiation field. If it's caused by something else, just the variation in the composition of the grains, for example, you can not only get the wrong correction, but it can even have the wrong sign. It's just a disaster if you aren't doing the temperature correction right. OK, so it's actually not clear that any existing dust map is adequate for cosmology in the 2020s, like LSST. Um, and of course, it goes without saying, those emission-based maps are not 3D, so they're not adequate for a lot of work in the Milky Way either. So how did we get to this situation where it's 2016 and all of the dust maps we have are garbage? So uh, OK. So now let's go back to stellar reddenings. This, this was done decades ago. You know, I'm almost back to Wolf's original paper, right? You know, oh, stars change color. Although he was a little confused about dust versus gas in that paper. But anyway, um, uh, what we can do nowadays with surveys of a billion stars, like pan stars, which covers three, million, um, three quarters of the sky, uh, we, we can actually infer the distribution of dust in three dimensions. And so we do this with about 800 million stars. We use two mass also when we can, uh, if the stars are bright enough in JHK. We have about 30 distance slices. We're trying to do a lot more, but this is both a computational problem and just the signal noise of the data limits us. For resolution, we're doing heel picks, pixels, um, about 1,024 in the plane and 256 at the high latitude, so think three arc minutes to 13 arc minutes. And uh, as for noise at high latitude in these bigger pixels, we get something like 10 to 15 millimags uh, RMS uncertainty in the reddening. SFD, by the way, is about twice that good in pixels that are half the size. 
Okay, so something like four times as good statistically. Um, but that's the worst case. That's at high latitude. As you get into the plane, this technique actually works extremely well. You just need enough stars to do the job. So this is a map of the whole sky. We're missing the part of the sky you can't see from Hawaii here, but three quarters of the sky. I'm going to zoom in on Ophiuchus up here so that you can see the level of detail in the map. Um, again, no far infrared photons were harmed in the production of this map. This is all stellar reddening. Uh, I'm going to now just look at this bit and compare. So this is SFD. Uh, the Planck map would be the same angular resolution. This is our star-based map. So you see there's a potential here to get rather higher resolution than we're used to based on stars. We go up to high latitude is lower resolution. This is uh, just a figure from the Green et al. 2015 paper. Green's my student. Um, these are three distance slices just showing that our technique separates the distance slices pretty well. This is a figure where we're going out in distance looking at the amount of dust in each volume element. Um, the flickering is uncertainty. I think there's a nice way to visualize uncertainty when you have a map that's coming from a Markov chain anyway. You have many samples, many realizations of what you're looking at. And so when you ask yourself the question, should I plot the mean or the median or what should I plot? Just plot the samples. And then you see the, uh, the uncertainty is flickering. When it stops flickering, that means uh, it's certain. And then this was on the... Uh, background when I started. This is just the parallax shift you would see in the local interstellar medium looking towards Orion, Perseus, Taurus, and so on. Uh, if we were orbiting the sun 10 million times further than usual, 50 parsecs. So, um, and I apologize here for not actually telling you how we do all this. This is an hour talk and I have 15 minutes. So uh, ask me at lunch how we do this. But it, it's just, you know, some grand Bayesian inference problem that burns millions of CPU hours, um, and, and uses the fact that we know what the stellar locus is in color, 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 color space. OK, now another problem that's swept under the rug here is RV. We know RV very spatially. This has been known for decades. Um, one of the nicest demonstrations of this, I think, comes from this very recent paper by Eddie Schlafly. And what he's doing here is taking uh, Apogee spectra from Sloan. So if you're not familiar, Apogee is an R22000 spectrograph that looks at stars in the near infrared. And uh, so even through a lot of dust, we can get the stellar spectra, get the stellar types. We know what color goes with those types. Now we can look at G, R, I, Z, Y from pan stars, J, H, K, and then Y is 1, Y is 2. So covering a factor of 10 in wavelength, we can look at uh, what the reddening does as a function of stellar type. And so basically, you, you have this 10 band spectrum of reddening for each star, each of 40,000 stars uh, using these aperture spectra. And then this is just color coding. This is not literally RV. This is some proxy that's kind of like RV. Um, and uh, red is low, blue is high. And unfortunately, we don't have apogee data everywhere. We only have it in these red, white, and blue circles. That's one Sloan field of view there in each circle. Um, but we have it over a lot of sky. The background map's just dust column just to you know, keep track of where you are. But the interesting thing here is large coherent structures. See, that looks red. That looks blue. That looks blue. We weren't really expecting this. I don't know what we were expecting. Um, you might have expected each cloud would have a different RV. They have different histories. You might have expected kind of smooth variation. But, you know, it really looks like there's actual structure here in the RV distribution. So this motivates, if any of you are in a position to decide such things, uh, as Apogee goes on in the 2020s, taking more data, and as they put a clone of Apogee on the DuPont telescope in the south so that we can get the rest of the galactic plane, I think it's going to be wonderful if we can just fill in everything here and make a map of RV everywhere. But I started by talking about 3D maps. So um, let me just, I would remiss, be remiss to not point out, this is the dust within one kiloparsec of us, according to our map. And at least in this part of the sky, which is, I mean, that is like three quarters of a plane there. Um, you'll notice a correlation 
between nearby dust and redness. It is as if the dust that's near us has a lower RV than the average dust in the Milky Way. And that was not obvious to me before we made these pictures. There's another interesting correlation. This is Planck beta. So if you model the uh, emission observed by Planck from the dust as frequency to the beta times uh, black body, this is the beta. Okay, so ignore the galactic plane where things are confusing. Just look at high latitude, dark, 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 light, light. Okay, where there's more of this nearby low RV dust, Planck beta seems to be systematically different. Um, and in, indeed, there's, uh, there's a correlation that we show in one of our other papers just in general between RV of dust on a line of sight and Planck beta. And it's, it's, it's a noisy correlation, but it's not that bad. Uh, is it the opposite of what you would expect if it were grain growth? I think so, which is puzzling. So, you know, we can come back to this if you like, but that's an interesting mystery. Okay, so this is uh, the observations. This is what Eddie did, Planck, nearby dust. This is Eddie's 3D RV model evaluated for the same 40,000 stars that went into this. So this is just really, I mean, this is so simple I didn't think it, could work. This is literally the simplest thing you can do, which is to bin up the galactic plane in XY coordinates in big chunks, like 250 parsecs, even ignoring the Z variable. Just say each of those you know, columns in the plane has a different RV that's fit what it has to be to satisfy the data. And now let's evalu evaluate that model. Uh, there's no Z dependence. You see Z dependence here because that dust is closer than that dust. And the distances are in the model, just not the z dependence. So this is not fitting too many numbers this way, and uh, the problem is quite overconstrained. And so you get this very simple model of what RV dust is where, and I would claim that bears more than a passing resemblance to that. If you, in fact, if you subtract the two, the difference looks a lot like noise. So um, that's just zooming in on those two panels again, so you can see this. So what Eddie has done here is really taken the first, you know, large angle, large volume stab at a 3D map of RV, and I think we could do a lot better. So what is needed for a better map? We need more stars. Um, I'll be done in one minute. Uh, you know, something like LSST gives us 10 or 20 times as many stars as we're using right now. Uh, we're getting deck cam data in the south. We have observing programs in the plane. Other people are doing things off the plane with deck cam. So in a few years, we'll have that all filled in. Um, Subpixel priors. So if you know you're on the edge of a filament or a cloud or something, and you know that half the pixel has a cloud, that half doesn't, you can do this fit a lot better. So we've done a lot of experiments using other maps as subpixel priors for these rather big pixels we're using. Um, this will take some computer time and uh, hopefully a lot more Apogee spectra and we can really start to turn this into a 3D map of everything. So um, just to summarize, it's, you know, it's hard to do things that require dust maps when your dust maps are inadequate and I think the kinds of projects that are coming up, these large scale surveys, will be part of the solution to this. Um, let me just close by saying when I, was a, uh, when I was a grad student working on a dust map that was going to replace Burstein and Hylas, Carl could have been uncooperative and wrapped up in his ego and concerned about what was one of his most cited papers at the time being superseded by a couple of know-nothing grad students who didn't know anything about dust. But he was incredibly supportive and helpful the entire time, and I've always appreciated that. So thanks, Carl. So the Gaia release is coming up fairly soon. How's that going to help you? Um, sorry, what is the Gaia the data release is oh, going to come Gaia, up? Yes, Gaia should be wonderful. So within the nearest three or four kiloparsecs, anyway, Gaia gets pretty good parallaxes for a lot of these stars. Of course, going out further, the stars have to be quite bright. Um, and I think uh, one way to look at this is it may be more helpful for RV than other things. If you have gray dust on the line of sight, that's degenerate with putting your stars at different distances. 
and most of these billion stars we're using, we don't know the distance. We're inferring it from the data. And so if you had uh, you know, some gray dust mixed in, that would, get, that would really confuse this algorithm. Um, now, uh, changing RV is not that different than a linear combination of some gray dust and dust with a different RV. So um, that tells me that parallaxes will stabilize the fit in a way that really helps us constrain RV better. Okay, so uh, you show the variation of RV over the skies, and I, I see that the, uh, the range of RV is from 3 to 3.6 in most cases. So are there any stars with lower RV than 3? Um, yeah, th I mean, there are a few outside this range. By the way, I, I should emphasize that this is not precisely RV. The way Eddie ended up defining his proxy for RV, it shifted by about 0.15 from the usual definition of RV. So don't go away thinking, oh, the average over the sky is 3.3, because it's more like 3.15. But anyway, um, yeah, there's, so remember, we're not looking at clouds with AV of 10 here, or you know, really dense clouds. Um, there are certainly clouds out there where people have made a convincing measurement of 5.5 .5 or things like that. We're not looking at those clouds. This is all fairly diffuse stuff. Okay, thank you. Hi, Doug. Really nice stuff. Um, I just want to ask, what, what are the prospects for extending this into that um, southern sky gap you have there? Because we have a lot of uh, multi-transition CO surveys in that area with thrums and ascetigism, and we're in the process of doing a three-dimensional density decomposition in those directions. So it would be really wonderful to be able to combine this sort of thing with the gas density estimates. Great. Yeah, well, two things. We, we realized, you know, after spending years on the PanSTARS data trying to do this as carefully as possible, um, of course, you can do it with only two mass. You don't need PanSTARS. If you only use two mass, I think the noise is about a factor of four worse. But depending on what you're doing, it might be adequate. Um, and of course, this is no surprise because people like Charlie Lotta and others, probably people in this room, were doing things like this with JHK a, a long time ago. Um, but try to use all the bands we can over a wide range turned out to be a lot more challenging. Um, we're also, you know, deck cam. Any, any place where we have deck cam data, we can do this. And so that'll be the next round. <laughs>